Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray Cool. I'm CEO of PBSI Technology Solutions, and I want to thank you for joining and welcome you to today's webinar, Email Security Practices. Today is the second of fourth cybersecurity education series webinars for clients and friends of Foster and Motley, who I want to thank, knowing that the genesis of this series was entirely on the part of Foster and Motley staff thinking. We know we have clients who store important information. How can we help them make sure <clears throat> that the information is stored safely? So our goals are very straightforward to educate and improve knowledge about electronic security and provide practical information about what options uh, may help improving our secure future. So last session, we talked about a broad overview of personal information security. Today, we're going to dive into specifically email security practices. Uh, a lot of what we'll cover will be information you already know. My uh, guess is there will be some new information, things that might help because we continually learn and email security has been a very, very significant attack vector for the bad guys. So that's what we'll talk about today. Upcoming next time, a very important session, password management. This is a, some people would say impossible. It's not impossible, but very important problem that we all face. How do we manage our passwords? We'll talk about some options that are safe and uh, what are the choices. And in the last session, we'll talk about file encryption, cloud security, public Wi-Fi. So thank you for joining. Today, our agenda is very straightforward. After a short discussion, where I'm going to do a short demonstration identifying, bringing to light why it's important that we practice email security. We'll overview the fundamentals of email security and we'll go through a bunch of examples and principles about how to spot dangerous emails. So for background context, PBSI, of whom I'm, I'm the CEO, is a technology services and security services provider in the uh, Tri-State with hundreds of clients, including Foster and Motley, who, uh, in, in our experience with other clients, very professional organization, excellent staff. And I don't say that for any other reason that uh, it's true. That's our experience. So at PBSI, I'm very fortunate and blessed to say that 75% of our staff have been with PBSI at least 10 years. And long-term experienced people really help clients. And we're an organization of active learners. So it's from the learning we do that we publish content like this. So everybody listening today knows the internet is a dangerous place. And last time we sp uh, briefly spoke about this same uh, information where the most difficult thing to deal with in today's world is malware that's installed and doesn't announce itself. It's not trying to elicit ransomware at the get-go. It may sit around for months and collect information and the fact is that key logging software is in place on an unknown number of uh, millions and millions of PCs where information is being captured and then used and sold. And they are not looking for a particular organization. They're not looking for Foster and Motley. They're not looking for PBSI. They're not looking for you. They're electronically pinging every IP address in the world to see what they can learn and when they're electronic techniques get under the surface, then they evaluate what they have on the inside. And if what they find is information that has value to them, then um, attacks become more uh, difficult. So there are a ton of exposed emails and passwords of 6.2 billion emails that are exposed on the dark web available for sale to the bad guys for fractions of a penny a significant percentage have exposed cracked passwords. And I'm going to do a short demonstration that um, provides some insight about that. And specifically, I didn't log into the site in advance today so that you can see an example of what we're gonna talk about a little later called multi-factor authentication. And you'll also see a um, an example of how my password manager is used to help keep information secure. What I'm going to do is go to the dark web through PBSI pays a monthly fee to access the security software that allows us to poke into the dark web and find exposures for email addresses or domains. So let me say this, um, if you are concerned, and frankly, each one of us should be concerned, that you have 
an email address, your own, your spouses, family members, if you want to send to PBSI a list of email addresses to check, we'll um, do the check I'm about to do now for free for anyone who's a Posture Molly client. So just remember, it's free service, send us your email addresses if you want us to check. So now I'm gonna click on this link. And what's happening is this is going to a secure website. This is the security provider who publishes this service. I'm now going to log into their website first. I'm using my password manager. So by clicking on that, so LastPass is the password manager I use. I'm now going to key in my master password, which I do not save on my PC ever. And that supplies the password to this website. So there it is. In addition to that though, multi-factor authentication is required. So the second step of login, I'm now going to my phone and I'm pulling up an authenticator application, which for this site gives me a code that's valid for another 21 seconds. I enter it in. So what I've just done is used a, both a password manager and multi-factor authentication. And that has, um, and you can see LastPass is asking me, do I wanna store this password? Uh, no, I do not. So um, now I'm gonna do the search that caused me to come here. So you can see here that there are 6 billion compromised uh, passwords out there. I can give you a lot of information. You can see on this slide where in the world uh, the majority of hacks have come for, from in the recent past. Uh, China is the most uh, prevalent. Brazil, interestingly, is second, India third. Anyway, that's beside the point. What I'm gonna do now is going to do a search. So I could search for an individual Gmail address. I could search for anything. I'm going to search for pbsinet.com. I'm going to expose uh, our own company. And uh, when I click on this, it tells me the list of names. So here is Ray and what used to be my old normal password. Um, Ray has an exposed password. Teresa does, Ron does, Linda does, and so forth. So the the demonstration there is to identify that there are exposed passwords and some of them have been cracked. Like here's one where the password was stored that was encrypted, it's been cracked. There is no shame in having your passwords exposed. Passwords get exposed when reasonable people like you, me, and any other um, of us store our password on a website. So we do this all the time. Your banks, your credit cards, your Foster and Motley accounts, and that's perfectly fine and safe. Unfortunately, what happens is sites get hacked. Now, Foster Motley has uh, lots of protection in place to make that a you know, very, very difficult thing, as does PBSI, but so did Cisco, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Yahoo, Gmail, MySpace, and so forth, all of them were hacked. So uh, the fact is, when we store our login and pa our email and password on a website, there is no guarantee that that won't be exposed. And once exposed, it can never be forgotten. So the password you just saw exposed from PBSI may have been exposed 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but they're not forgotten. And the bad guys can purchase those combinations of email addresses and passwords for fractions of a penny, and they do, and they can try that combination on every website in the world if they want to, go to every bank, every credit card company, every 401k uh, login. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's very likely you have a one or more passwords exposed. And it's one of the reasons we're gonna talk about email security today and password security next time. Don't reuse passwords. Um, so that's hopefully a heads up. I'm not trying to frighten anybody, but um, there's nothing like understanding that, oh my gosh, it really happened to me as well. So the security world is very dangerous. And now we're gonna talk about email security. What are some of the things we can do to uh, secure email and to know that we are safe? So there's a handout that's included both in the last session and the same one today relative to email safety where these principles are laid out. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about five principles. First of all, solicited versus unsolicited email. You get an email from Ray at PBSI. Let's say you know me, you trust Ray, you get an email from me if you requested it or you expected it, that's solicited. You asked me a question, I answered it, that's solicited. Low risk of that being a dangerous email. On the other hand, you get an email from Ray, anything that's out of context. Why did Ray send me this email? 
the context just seems a little unusual. Anything that uh, makes your head, um, ears perk up for any reason whatsoever, stop, stop, stop and consider because unsolicited emails are frequently, if somebody's email is hacked, um, unsolicited emails can be received and uh, almost always an unsolicited email that's from a hacker is gonna do something bad and you don't wanna click on it. So even if it's from a known source, be careful if it's unsolicited. Anything usual, unusual about this email, and you may have had the experience for years, there's been a fairly routine thing that happens. It used to be a lot with Yahoo accounts, but it could be any email where you get a short email with a short list of um, contacts from a friend or family member, somebody you know, and you look at the other contacts and you're aware, yeah, those are people that my friend knows, and so you think it's safe. Well, no, what's happened is their email address in their uh, contact list have been compromised and a small group were chosen, you included, to receive this one email and usually it's brief. Check this out, thought of you, anything like that, stay away from that email. So just know that an unsolicited email is uh, dangerous even if, if it appears to be from someone you know. Uh, two, just to continuing the same thought, antenna up on all email. Always the question should be, uh, why do I need to click on this and why do I need to click on it now? And the more urgency that is implied by the email I received, the more I ought to be cautious before clicking. Evaluate the time of day it was received, sent, recipient list, brief contact, out of character. Why would this person send this email to me? The spellings, grammar mistakes, unusual phrasings, formatting, not all bad emails come from outside of the United States. However, non-English speaking um, origins will frequently result in things that can be spotted, not always. Number three, don't get your news from your email. I'm gonna show you examples today of a couple that um, I have indelibly etched in my memory because I received these in my inbox and I thought, I had no idea that took place. Well, it was a news email of something that hadn't really happened, it really was fake news. I'll give you uh, examples of those. But current events, product releases, things that are of great interest, whatever current event, um, if you get an email related to news about congressional hearings going on, uh, stay away from that. Go to the news website directly. Don't click in an email link. So disasters, holiday messages, Valentine's messages will happen regularly. Um, tax emails related to protect your W-2 or something that looks like it's in your best interest. Um, don't click on news emails, even if it appears to be from your favorite news source, because it may not be. Social media, same thing. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, whichever social media, the bad guys um, really use this, and you just can't trust that your friends are foolproof. If they've re-shared something, um, or an ad appears on their site, they didn't approve that ad. So just be careful, careful on social media. It's a dangerous place. Um, anything too good to be true? How many free $50 gift card offers can you receive? Um, just ignore it. Um, okay, so antenna up. So two more principles. Careful with unsubscribe. We all receive more junk mail than we want to receive. And the concept of unsubscribing is perfectly fine, but I no longer unsubscribe to any emails at all unless I'm really certain. Like it's Macy's, Macy's Heaven One Day, I'm tired of getting these emails. I'm sure it's from Macy's. I can unsubscribe safely because Macy's is a fine, respectful site. However, things that, uh, I don't know exactly how I got on their list. Instead in Outlook, I use I right click on the email, I choose junk and block sender. So the difference is if I say unsubscribe, I am conferring my email address to the bad guys and it's even more dangerous if they ask for more information. The more things I'm asked when unsubscribing, I think, wait a minute here, um, I shouldn't need to do anything more than make a click. And they can either use these to confirm that your email address is real and know that they've got uh, something to attack further or to initiate attack if they gain any information from you. So just be well aware that unsubscribe is a dangerous thing. And in other non-Outlook uh, products, there are other ways to 
mark email as junk. So the result of marking something as junk, it's the same as unsubscribe. They will they may continue to send to you, but it will never reach your inbox. So this is a good way to not alert them and uh, to remain safe and unclutter our inboxes. Um, this is something that is really important, and I'm going to provide a bit of detail that's technical, but how do I evaluate when I receive an email that it's okay or not? And a real key is to understand truly what is the domain name of the account of the uh, sender of this communication. So the DNS, the domain name, is a part of your URL. So the domain name starts after the first period and ends before the first single slash. In the examples below, it might be HTTP or TTPS. So S means it's encrypted, but a HTTPS can be a very bad email. So lots of people can get encrypted sites. That's not a reason to think this is safe. The www is a typical follower and then is what you're interested in after the first period. Example.com in this case is the domain of the sender. And then after the first slash, everything else is extraneous and isn't really important. So the uh, domain name itself can be long. So here's just an example that says blah, blah, blah. It's after the first period, before the first slash. Um, the bad guys use this to seem okay. Uh, UPS.com is a real site, but uh, returns.ups.com is not, nor is um, you know, freereturns.ups.com or any other examples. Uh, you just need to realize that extensions at the beginning or extensions at the end are meant to fool you to look like a legitimate sites. So really carefully evaluate the domain name. Okay, so those are five basic principles. The uh, couple other things that are really important, email security centers uh, settings, turn on multi-factor authentication. So hopefully everybody listening is familiar with the concept of multi-factor authentication where usually your phone, but it could be a different device, gets involved in authenticating that you are really you. This is increasingly important. Microsoft recommends that every single user of Microsoft 365 turn on multi-factor authentication, and so do we at PBSI, and we've seen the uh, downside when you don't. So here's the reason this is so important. And whatever email you use, there is a way to turn on multi-factor authentication. And if you don't already get confirmed, at least periodically, with a second contact, so you log in and after 60 days on your Gmail, it says, I just sent a code to your mobile number, uh, please authenticate. That's what multi-factor authentication is. It's making sure that whoever's using this email address really has access to the second device. Um, so any place, uh, bank apps, investment logins, any place where you have uh, key information, go to options on their website and almost always you'll find with key sites an option to turn on multi-factor authentication. It's a little bit of a hassle, but here's why it's important. When uh, bad guys hack an email, which can be done anytime we have made in the past a click mistake. And by that click mistake, we installed something bad. Somebody used that to get a hold of our email. Now they have control of our email. Uh, when they do that, they can use the email and send emails from me out to other people on my contact list, and I don't know about it. And they do some really nefarious things when they do that, like, and I'll talk more about this, but all this is right now related to multi-factor authentication. I prevent them doing that by using multi-factor authentication because the first time they try and take advantage of the email information they gained, it's being accessed from a new account. The confirmation or from a new device, the confirmation comes to me on my phone and I can say, wait a minute, no, that wasn't me. And I prevent, even though they've gotten into my email, they can't use it because they don't have my phone. Uh, otherwise, once they have it, they'll send out emails and probably every one of us has received one or many examples of this where we get an, an email from somebody we know and uh, it's odd, but it's they're sending us an invoice that's attached or some other information with attachments or links. And we think, well, hmm, why did they send that to me? And you, and you click and all of a sudden you've been hacked and what happened is 
they were hacked, their contact list was used, they sent out the emails, and uh, now many of the people who received that email will reply back to the recipient and say, hey, this, did you really send me this invoice? Except for what the bad guys do is as a routine process, they set an auto forward such that any replies to an email they send get auto forwarded to them so the person who's been hacked never even knows it. So uh, more about that, but turn on multi-factor authentication. It's really important. It's uh, your most dangerous attack vector protected. For those of you using Microsoft 365, I wanna make you aware this is a really important thing. There's an add-on option that costs $2 a month called Microsoft Defender for 365. This is not Microsoft Defender, your free antivirus on your PC. This is a specific product that provides click protection in emails. So what, the way this works is if you add this option to 365, then when you make a click on an email or an attachment, Microsoft sends that click out through a site they call SafeLink, they fully explode whatever's gonna happen. And uh, if anything bad is there, you simply get a message saying that was malicious. And every time you receive a message like that, you realize that just saved me from some kind of a hack that would have taken place. So really important product. And if you have questions about how to do any of this, feel free to contact us at PBSI. And then with corporate accounts, uh, which may apply to some who are listening, um, make sure your IT sets a transport rule to block auto forwarded emails. It prevents exactly what I just described, which the bad guys otherwise will do unless this rule is set. So, separately, before you click on any link, hover over it. You can right click on a link and you can uh, copy it so you can evaluate it because the link that's shown in an email might say free gift card, but when you click on it, it's really going to a different site. Um, so if you think a request may be legitimate, instead of clicking, go to that vendor's site, the news site or the bank site, log in there, and if you have a message, it'll be there on their site. You don't need to click on that email. Um, recent and ongoing spoofs, tax season's coming, protect your IRS account now, reset your PIN number, there's been a problem with your W-2. These are predictable, but they're, um, they will fool many of us, uh, 365, your domain expires today. Oh my gosh, my email is going to run out. Click here to keep current password. I got this one recently. I'll show you the example where, yeah, I want to have to reset my password. So I'm happy to click there, except for good men bad. Any text alerts you get, there are occasionally, you'll get a text alert from your bank that says your credit card may have been exposed or whatever. So those aren't bad, but they won't ask you to click. And um, basically don't click in texts for any uh, security related warning. Google's detected unusual activity. They will not ask you to click in an email. Um, your account needs renewal. Uh, basically never respond to requests for confirmation or reset, even if they know some information about you because there's data exposed out there where they may have this and still they're hackers, but they don't have everything they need. They don't have your password. And if you've made a mistake, if you think, uh oh, I shouldn't have done that, change your password. So show it that account because once your password has changed, they can't use the data that they've had in the past. So those are some important principles. I'm gonna just quickly now go through some examples. So security warning emails, the, the bad guys know the thing that will put fear into somebody is saying you've been compromised. So here's an example, incorrect password limit reached, message from Amazon customer service. All they want us to do is say, is this really you? No, don't click that, that's not okay. Here's one I got recently in January that when I looked at it was obviously not from Microsoft, but it said, hey, here's my email address and your password expires today, click here to keep your password. These are just um, shipping confirmations, Amex, UPS. These are based on guesses that um, you may well have something that's waiting for you or, oh, I didn't know I had a package waiting. It's um, hopefully not new to everybody to avoid those. Faxes are frequently, you get a e-fax into your email uh, and you think, oh, I'm not sure what this is, but that doesn't mean you should click it because if you clicked on this one, you would have gotten a message that you've now been ransomware attacked and please click here to pay your Bitcoin to be un-ransomware. Uh, here are two emails that came into my inbox. One appeared to be 
from NBC News. NBC News at NBCAlerts.com is not a real email address, but how would I know that for sure? And this one, the guy in Charlottesville he drove his car through a field that says he was acquitted. And I remember receiving this and thinking, really? But I didn't click. And same thing here. This never happened when the United Airlines uh, passenger was thrown off a flight. This has been some years ago. This email came in that says the CEO resigned over the controversy. And I remember thinking, whoa, really? It never happened. This person never resigned, or at least he hadn't been. Uh, just other examples, bank emails that ask you to click, stay away from that, go to the bank site. Here's a statement that I got from Huntington, who we bank with. There's no place to click. Sometimes banks will give you options to click. It's not necessarily a foolproof thing, but just go directly to the site is the safe way to do it. Um, I want to be a good guy. Here's an opportunity to donate. If I'd clicked on any one of these donation options, attack would have happened. Here's one that came recently from Microsoft, and they did this really nice thing. I highlighted it saying, trusted sender. Oh, <laughs> and our, my first reaction was, oh, good, this is a trusted sender. Well, no, this is just a ruse that they put up here to make it seem more um, legitimate. So you just have to be really careful. Look at the email address. Uh, and if you're not 100% certain of any of these that are unsolicited, just stop. Um, so you want to see your improve your credit score or see your credit score or whatever. So those are just some examples of the whole idea is just know that the bad guys are very clever. So other email safety principles, uh, we've reviewed today the five basics, solicited versus unsolicited, antenna up all the time, don't get news from email, careful with unsubscribe, evaluate the domain name, turn on multi-factor authentication, use Microsoft Defender, if you use 365, it's well worth the $2 a month. And uh, when in doubt, stop. So those are the principles uh, that we um, cover today. There's more. If you're a security administrator in an organization, I'd have a lot more to say to you about how to protect your organization's email. But for those of us who have Gmail accounts or whatever, uh, you protect yourself by your behavior. The overall summary that includes Last time where we need to secure our desktops, we need to secure our email. Next time we're going to talk about passwords, the time after that about public Wi-Fi and file encryption. Um, and if you want to know if your PCs are safe, uh, consider having online security monitoring done. It's inexpensive, it's cost effective, it's really useful because most of us just can't know for sure on our own PCs that everything's okay because the bad guys aren't trying to warn us they're sitting there collecting information. So that is the um, completion of content today. I want to thank you for your attendance. I'm going to uh, dive into questions here in a moment, and I'll turn off the recording before I do that. But uh, be aware, if you want information about security services, uh, we offer security services on a discounted basis to Foster Motley clients, which include we can scan your PCs to identify uh, data at risk. That would be unencrypted data that includes sensitive information, social security numbers, credit card numbers, that kind of thing. So there are a couple of options for one-time evaluations. Security risk assessment includes the data breach, breach scan, plus a review of all of the software using in your PCs and a discussion and review about whether you're uh, protected enough. And we've had many questions, by the way, about Macs. Macs and PCs have not an equal degree of vulnerabilities, but uh, very much the same. Increasingly, Macs are attacked, and the same kind of antivirus and monitoring solutions that are important for PCs are also important for Macs. Um, so there are a couple of online security options that would include uh, annual fees, and um, one includes ransomware protection. The vendor of this product says you cannot get ransomware on a device that is protected by this product. Uh, so anyway, not trying to sell products, but be aware that if you'd like to request a quote, we can uh, provide information. And uh, we will not contact you unless you request a quote. So just know that. So today we've talked about email security practices. Next time we'll talk about password management. Really important. A uh, lot of detail and options that I believe will help anyone who struggles with passwords. So thank you for uh, your attendance. I'm now going to end today's recording. Um, Thanks for your participation.